All right, everybody, let's gather around our digital listening devices. It is time for Nostalgia Trap. My name is David Parsons. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're ready for this one because I am very excited to share this conversation. My guest today is Elizabeth Becker. She is an author and a journalist who's written a number of important works over the years um, and has an absolutely extraordinary life story. We get into some of those details in this conversation. But I wanted specifically to speak with her about her latest book, which is called You Don't Belong Here, How Three Women Rewrote the Story of War. This book uh, offers a sort of detailed histories of three different journalists. Their names are Kate Webb, Catherine Lewis, and Francis Fitzgerald, all of whom went to Vietnam during the Vietnam War uh, and were pioneers, not just because they were women, but because of their specific journalistic contributions and the perspectives that they gave to us uh, on the war. And we get into each one of them in this conversation, so I won't detail that now. Other than to say, you know, if you've been following along with NOM TV, which is my uh, lecture series on the Vietnam War, my own history of the Vietnam War this summer uh, over on the Patreon page, um, you know that I've been using Frances Fitzgerald's work a lot. Her book is called Fire in the Lake, the Vietnamese and the, America and the Americans in Vietnam. This won the Pulitzer Prize in 1972. Um, and Elizabeth Becker in this conversation gives us sort of the backstory of Frances Fitzgerald writing this book and why it's so important. It gives us a, a, a perspective on uh, Vietnamese culture and politics that just wasn't around. And I, I honestly, it's, it's, I've never read a book um, in all the historiography of the Vietnam War uh, that has such rich detail on that culture and politics and gives you a perspective on things that is just absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, so all of these women contributed really important uh, ideas uh, and histories for, uh, for us all the way to today. Um, and part of the story is, is, is how little we hear about their work, too. Um, so we get into why that is, and, and, and I, I, can't, again, can't recommend Fire in the Lake enough. Um, but all of these women are, are really important. So this was a really fun conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. We've got lots more Nostalgia Trap stuff out there, including what I just mentioned, uh, Nom TV, my video and audio uh, lecture series on the Vietnam War, which you can access at patreon.com slash Nostalgia Trap. Really appreciate the subscribers uh, that are keeping that program going. So if you can head over there and check it out, I really appreciate it. And let's get to this conversation. Here is me uh, talking with Elizabeth Becker. Okay, Elizabeth Becker, thank you so much for joining me. I want to say the name of your book, um, your latest book, uh, right at the front, just so we get it out. Uh, it's it's called You Don't Belong Here, How Three Women Rewrote the Story of War. And it's particularly about uh, women journalists during the Vietnam War. Um, but thank you so much. I appreciate you coming on the show. Well, thank you invited, for inviting me. Um, I wonder why, I mean... One of the things we're interested in on this show is new angles on the Vietnam War. Um, there, uh -huh. there seems like there's been, um, especially, uh, you know, in the in the decades since the Vietnam War, a very particular American narrative in American pop culture uh, and in, and even in history. And and it seems like your book is part of something I'm seeing a lot lately, which is new angles, um, new sort of entryways into the same story. What, why did you want to write this book about about the experience of women journalists? Because it, it feels like a really important part of the, the story of the Vietnam War that we haven't heard a lot about. Um, you've heard probably nothing. And that's why I wrote the book. Um, I was afraid that it would be lost. Quite, It's that simple. And the reason why that's important is not just simply because they're women. It's because... During the Vietnam War, women finally broke through the glass ceiling. And they did it through not only, uh, in, 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 particularly in two different areas. First of all, the military itself. Until Vietnam, women were not allowed to cover the combat. So all the famous women you know from World War II, like Martha Gellhorn, she did great reporting, but she was not allowed on the battlefield. And most people don't realize that. In Vietnam, because of several circumstances, women did find their way onto the battlefield and then convinced the military to suspend the ban. 
And it, they were so good that the ban was never replaced. So they broke the military ban. And plus, um, they also broke through the media ban um, until, until Vietnam. Uh, women, women just weren't foreign correspondents, much less war correspondents. And so, mm. the, again, the women you knew were generally, not always, but generally um, freelancers. Mm. And, and uh, very, very, very few in Vietnam, more of us went, but we all paid, we paid our own way. We bought our own tickets and we arrived with no jobs, no health insurance, no place to live, nada. And we had to find, once we got there, we had to find places that would publish our stuff and pay us enough money to survive. And these three women were not only the pioneers, but they were brilliant. And they, they raised the level, not only for women, but for the entire uh, media. So they changed the way war was seen and reported. And that's why I wrote the book. What was the the culture of of war reporting in the Vietnam War? Because it does seem like it's different, right? I mean, it does feel like there's there, there's a culture and there's a set of I mean, beyond culture, there's a set of practical rules too. Um, it, you know, in my head, and I feel like in the head of in the American imagination, there's this very macho sort of image of a war reporter. Um, and mythology continues all the way to today. Was that part of the the resistance, this idea that this was, I mean, it's in the title of your book, this idea that this was a entirely male world. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no yeah. question. And I, I, one of my, um, I opened the book with a quote from Peter Arnett, a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter who said, um, you know, women didn't belong here. Uh, we didn't treat them well. Uh, if they had to put up with humiliation and we were mostly interested in, was interested in them sexually. Mm -hmm. And women just w did not belong there. And they, it, the sense was men fought wars, men covered wars. And it was, it, there was, everything was open about, they were open about it. It's, there's no shame to this. They just said, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. And um, that's, what, that was what? it. And go ahead. But it was also codified in the media itself. Mm -hmm. So back home in the United States, um, if I had not gone to Cambodia, the Cambodia campaign, I came late in the day, um, largely I would have had to go to the ladies section and cover furniture or family or fashion mm. and family, that sort of stuff, or not be a journalist. There was, it was called the pink ghetto. Mm. And women were not in the 60s, the late 60s. The, the, if you remember, the war was from 65 to 75. Yeah. And... <clears throat> When these three women, Kate Webb, Catherine Lehua, and Frances Fitzgerald got there, women hadn't even filed any suits yet to try to get into the mainstream media. It was that early in the day. So you didn't have women covering national politics. You had some of the women got into writing columns and stuff like that, but it was there was very rare for a woman to have that kind of a career. I'm not saying no yeah, one did, yeah. but it's very rare. And um it was in the beginning about just about when the war ended. That's when you started to see a lot of lawsuits back home in the United States mm. of women saying, OK, media, you have to. Part of civil rights is gender rights. I remember. Thank you, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I'm, you know, I, I'm thinking about like the context of 60s feminism and Betty Friedan's book coming out in 19, what, 63 but 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 then a lot of the sort of real like legal changes and uh, that, that that feminism brings don't come until later, like in the 1970s. So it seems like this yes. this this period of the Vietnam War is where this this like real sort of pioneering work is being done. But I wonder, like, what is the are, are, is, is, do the women that and I'm sure it's different for everyone and it might be different for you as well. But do the women that are that are entering into this really, um, you know, uh, this this world that is very male dominated and there's so much resistance um, in a million different ways. Do they do they perceive that they're doing something groundbreaking? Do they perceive that they are part of a feminism or a woman's revolution or, you know, how much of it is seen as like, you know, activism or political work? Um, probably nothing. We did not know what we were doing. I cannot <laughs> overstress. <it. Yeah. laughs> We did not, we had no idea what we were up against. And, and remember, I don't get there until 73. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, the women in 66, 67, 
they hadn't a clue. Yeah. They didn't know about the ban. They didn't know just how deep the resistance of the media organizations were, much less the way they would be treated. Uh, they weren't taken ser- They didn't know that they wouldn't be taken seriously by the people they wanted to interview. The whole show, no. So, in fact, feminism—it was then called mostly women's liberation—was a bad word. Hmm. And if you even mentioned it, you were considered, um, you know, knee jerk. You couldn't get on. You couldn't get a- along on your own. So you had to have the crux of women's liberation, and you were probably ugly. Mm-hmm. And- Mm-hmm. So, so forth and if oh you're probably even lesbian and you know it was like yeah. uh, it was it was no not only did they not feel that way they were shocked by what they met and when they succeeded they did not um act like um oh yay aren't we great in fact um the first real big story about what they accomplished wasn't written until 30 years later mm. because you yeah. didn't you not brag about it. And you kept it quiet so that people wouldn't realize what you were doing and telling you you couldn't do it. Well, it's also, it seems like the work speaks for itself in some ways too, right? It seems like the, the work- well, the, that's the, the only thing that's the only thing that spoke for the women were there, was their work, yes. Uh, can we can we talk about the individual women? Because they're, each each one of them, to, I think you've, you've, you've chosen, you've you know, part of writing a book like this seems like curating, you know, three specific people. And it seems like hard to choose three, but it seems like you've, you've chosen three that represent very different sort of elements of the, of the war experience for for journalists and for women journalists. But how did you, how did you choose these three in particular? Um, Well, it's not as if I had a vast choice. Yeah. Okay. So we'll start there. (laughs) Right. So, but I chose the women who were pioneers, first of all, the women who did pay their own way, the women who did come and and forge a career out of nothing, and the women who persisted so that they could then go on and accomplish great things. And um, and they were women who also were original. Now, almost perforce, because we were women, we're outsiders. So it wasn't hard to be original, but these three were amazingly original. Mm. And I chose them by looking at the three areas of journalism that they chose, a, a mm. photographer, long form journalism and combat mm. reporter, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and which is your classic. And in those, just looking at those three, then it, made, it was easy because there was no question for all three. No question. They 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 climbed the mountain. They won the awards. They changed how uh, reporting. So once I narrow, I once I figured out how I was going to choose the woman, then it was easy. Uh, let's start with Frances Fitzgerald because I, I feel like I mean this is a a a, a writer of a of, she's the one that I assume is the long form journalist, yes, right? Of right. So she wrote this book um, for for listeners that don't know. Uh, Frances Fitzgerald wrote a book called Fire in the Lake: The Vietnamese and the Americans in Vietnam. Came out in 1972. Won a ton of prizes, including the Pulitzer Prize and the Bancroft Prize. It's it's it should be, and I think it is considered by some historians as sort of canonical major early history of the war, and yet. You know, I just watched your interview on on CNN, um, and and you you were talking about how this you know that that book is not really in the in the major bibliographies of the war. It's not as as much as like you know books like um, I don't know Neil Sheehan or David Halberstam or those those major contributors. Um, but can you talk a little bit about Frances Fitzgerald and and what drove her to 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 want to write a a total history so early in the war, actually while the war is still going on? Well, um, she's interesting. Well, first, she's the only American of the three. Yep. And she comes from um, an amazing uh, Gatsby kind of background. Mm. Patrician, wealth, New England, uh, cultured, 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 um, totally politically connected at the highest levels. And um, you know, she she had chauffeurs for her grade school. She had her horse boarded at her boarding school. Uh, she graduated with honors from Radcliffe and um, she's extremely smart. And she, she, you know, she's, if she'd followed her, her coterie, her peer group, she would have made a good marriage um, to a successful, similar kind of guy, Ivy league guy. And um, 
dabbled in something or other and, and had great dinner parties. Uh, she didn't want to do that. She wanted to be a writer. And just like all of us, you don't know what the obstacles are until you try to do what you want to do. So she, the, the, the easiest way, so she goes to Newsweek, hmm. not the most, I mean, good, but not the greatest magazine and says, I would like to be a reporter. And they said, a writer. And they said, no, women are not qualified. The most you can do is be a researcher. Mm -hmm. So she even goes to Paris even, have, to write a with, novels, even with fails. all her connections, which is interesting. All of them. No. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, people think, oh, she's so wealthy. She has so many connections. Of course she did well. No, wrong, 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 mm -hmm. wrong, wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, so then... She does some freelancing of profiles of up and coming New Yorkers when she comes back to New York, which is you know totally unsatisfying, and um, has um, a, a affair, an affair she regretted and wanted to do something. Her father had had spent a lot of his career in Asia. Uh, her parents divorced when she was quite one young, so she had this you know understandable obsession with her dad, and she, so she decided she was going to go to Saigon. Now her dad at this stage is number three in the in CIA. Right. So it's right. like there's so many so bells should go off. Anyway, so she goes there. Um and um she's smart enough to bring some um uh, uh credentials, some uh, some uh magazines who said they wanted to publish her stuff if she wrote it, one of them being Vogue magazine. So she gets press credentials and then she starts writing. And even though she has a has a you know a wealthy person's um, trust fund. She won't waste her money on cable because she didn't know what's going to happen. And she actually is one of the few few reporters who puts her articles in in an envelope, puts a stamp on it in Saigon, and sends it to New York. Oh, wow. Which I think that's so courageous. Anyway, all of her articles are are happily printed because she writes so differently. And this is from the get go. She does not accept the the line of the day. And she writes what she sees. She writes, you know, how sources react. She writes the lies of the day. And, um, and I think one of the reasons she was so hip to the, the, the deception was because of her background. Mm -hmm. She grew mm -hmm. up with these people. She knew they had flaws. And yet she was still, she was still amazed at like an old friend, the diplomat Frank Wisner, who she grew up with and they were friends and he, he took her to parties and da 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 da. He never took her seriously while she was there. She she bemoans in her private writings that you know Frank won't talk to her seriously. None of them take her seriously. She's a woman, and so she goes off, and she decides she's not going to concentrate as they all do on battlefield reporting and um, the the top policymakers in Saigon, be it America, mm -hmm. and you know. Mm. All, that's the way rep the world was reported, and some were very good, some weren't. But she said, no, 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 no. I want to find out what this means to Vietnam. What are we doing here? And we can't know what we're doing here until we figure out what the Vietnamese think of us and what how we fit in their history. So she writes stuff that had never been written before. Um, she spent um, she goes back and forth to a village in the in the Delta, and writes a long piece for the New York Times magazine on on this village of Dunk. The clop and the life and death thereof, and the effect of the war. And um, you know, by night it's ruled by the um, Viet Cong, and by day by the government. And how the in between the peasants just say this this is horrible, but they think that the Viet Cong are going to win because anybody who has to rely on a foreign foreign army is not going to make it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This stuff had not been written. Yeah, I, and I'm when she does a profile of the city of Saigon, and instead of writing about the the everybody loves the romantic French quarter. She writes about the slums that have been developed because of the war. So she's, she's just, she just, and she doesn't have one editor telling her how to write. And how she how does not this, have like a lot of, I like that your, your idea of this is not that she's writing a counter narrative necessarily, but, but I heard you say that uh, writing an enlarging narrative, you know, sort of um, showing us more of what of what's there. I think it's fascinating to think that this is a daughter of a, a major figure in the CIA that's sort of providing this. And so there's something really amazing about that fact. But how is this stuff taken? In other words, like these 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 reports are are pretty devastating to the to the American narrative of what's going on if you're just concentrating on battlefields and reports from the state department you're not getting this stuff at all i wonder 
um, you know, I, when, when I hear that counter narrative again, I always hear like, you know, those other names. And it seems like this is someone who who we should be paying attention to well, because she broke the ground on it. Well, I, yeah, um, I'm not saying Neil Sheehan and David Halberstam and the others didn't didn't do amazing stuff. I love those. She guys. did something. <laughs> but um, uh, first of all, she wrote for magazines. So her work was not part of the daily was it, what is everybody else doing? So and and in in Vietnam itself, I'm not sure the Viet, the the U.S. the the foreign press club corps of Vietnam understood what she was doing. It it the effect was back in the United States, and it it grew and grew and grew, and then when she returned to write her book, the book is what broke it all open. How much uh, was this? Per- taken in i wonder like you talk about like the in in the united states this book and her writing in magazines like the new yorker and the new york times how much how much of it is, is seen as almost you know like anti-war sort of writing because it seems like the anti-war movement would be consuming that sort of knowledge and wanting to know you know that other side of the story it seems like it's oh yeah important for the for that for that viewpoint if that makes sense yeah, no, no, no. Um, and she was accused of writing for the anti-war movement. Right. There's no question. And her, she was cr- criticized for that, which which she wasn't. She, in fact, wasn't doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's part of the problem. Can you hear my phone? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's all right. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so um, the um, the in fact, just recently, what was it? One of the think tanks put out, this, these are the books to read about Vietnam. And they included um, Fire in the Lake, but they said this is a primer for the anti-war movement. Yeah, that's what I wanted to to, to understand. So, and and, and sh- hers came out the, the year after the Pentagon Papers. So people should not have been surprised. Right. Pentagon Papers, the 50th anniversary is this month, in fact. Um, but um, so they shouldn't have been surprised, but still. It's and then and then there's there's no question being a woman mm-hmm. did not help her. Yeah. Well, I'm. I, it's I, She's, for whatever reason I'm think when I when I think of Frances Fitzgerald, and I don't know if this is this is a, a, an appropriate analogy, but I, uh, I'm thinking about Jane Fonda in in terms of a person who was also from you know elite connections and decided to sort of you know go to Vietnam and be involved in an anti-war movement that didn't necessarily make her popular, not something she necessarily had to do she could have enjoyed all the dinner parties and been you know the same sort of the same sort of idea it seems like there were certain women particularly who were driven to reject that and and be involved in this side of things um not the best analogy i would say i mean jane (laughs) no 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 uh, not at all francis fitzgerald did not go as an activist at all okay and as a journalist that's part of what i'm trying to get at that's very important to us Uh you do not no, 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 no. Do not. Um, she was she was a writer and a journalist and she did not um, take activist stance. Mm. She refused labels, including she refused the idea that she was li- women's liberation. No labels for Frances Fitzgerald. OK, so, yeah. So I'm going to have to put the kibosh on that. No, I mean, I think it's a really important distinction, though. Yeah, it is. Um, what about uh, the other women that you've written about? Uh, Kate Webb in particular is is an australian uh war correspondent and she's she's experiences i mean her experience is 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 uh one that gets at the sort of insane danger that people face um can you talk a little bit about about how how she gets involved because her story seems like she was very young when she was over there i mean all of that all they were of all this, the same yeah. age they were all the same age when they got over there 25 26 wow. um so kate and I and I didn't until I started writing. I said, "Oh, this is so wonderful! I have each of my three women is from a different continent <laughs> and a different culture, uh, with a very special. Each had a different relationship to the war. Obviously, the Americas were totally involved, but the Australian Army was one of only two armies that fought with the United States, and that's one of the reasons Kate went. She foolishly thought she could cover the Australian Army." The, the the ban on the their ban against women held all the way through the war. Wow. She was um she was also precocious intellectually um from an intellectual 
family. Her dad was a professor. Her grandfather had been the, the Archbishop of New Zealand. She grew up in Australia. Um, she had several tragedies as, as a, a young woman, um, including her parents being killed in an automobile accident when she was, a t- when she was in college. So um, there was a push and pull with her as well. Um, mm. Push in the sense that um, she, also, she had never quite found her footing after the tragedies. Mm. She, and one of the jobs she could get was what we would call a copy boy in a, in a Sydney, Australian newspaper. And it was when she was doing that, she started to become intrigued by the war and she saw a way to enlarge her life and understand a, a question that her whole family had, her parents had been dedicated to um, Australia, you know, totally Anglophone member of the British empire and acting like it wasn't in Asia and her parents worked against that. Australia is in Asia. We should be accept our role, so on and so forth. So, you know, she she inherited that f- from her parents, and so there's all, all kinds of reasons. So she wanted to mm. see how that was going to work out. So she goes, but she's even more naive than the others. She doesn't even realize she should have brought a couple of letters for credentials. Mm. And when she looked, when she tried, she goes into the the American media, and goes to offices and at UPI, they said, why in the world would we hire a woman? I mean, and she can't get credentials to cover the war unless she has a media. And the only person who would give it to her was the only woman who was an editor in Vietnam. And that's a lovely woman named Ann uh, Mariano, who was running a GI newsletter Mm. that the Defense Department had tried to close, but she kept it going. And she gave Kate credentials so Kate could stay and start her career. Mm. And she, this intellectual, Kate Webb, proved to be brilliant at um, at combat reporting. Brilliant. Mm. And what was different about her combat reporting? Well, again, she didn't know how she was supposed to be writing. And that turns out to be a big plus. Yeah. So she writes, you know, she writes lyrical stuff. I mean, her um, coverage of the um, Tet Offensive, when the um, Viet Cong broke into the, the U.S. Embassy, she was one of the first to arrive. And she, her phrase in, in United Press International wire copy was, it looked like a butcher shop in Eden. Now, this is not normal writing. And that's yeah. in all the history books. You'll see this. Um, this phrase was picked up. And she, this is all through her books. But also, she was exceedingly um, diligent as a reporter. She she knew all the things you had to know about the military and she got to know them, mm-hmm. but she also got to know officers personally, whether it be American or Vietnamese and then later Cambodian. She knew their personalities. She hung out with them. She, she really infiltrated. And a lot of the reporters, they did their reporting and they came back, they had fun at night, da, 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 da. She, she was really involved in it. And um, so her copy, her, her daily reports read almost sometimes like short stories. Mm. And I quoted some of them where, um, for example, um, a helicopter crew, gunship crew, um, she'd been with them for a week just to feel what it was like to be in a gunship. And, and then she was writing, she was getting ready to write the story and the gunship was, um, was attacked and the two guys were killed. So she wrote the most amazing story. You wouldn't call it an obituary. It was these young kids and, you know, I'm having hard, she even says, I'm having a hard time writing. I'm sure. And so she says that in her copy that people don't say that. copy. So, um, and so she becomes a local hire, which means that her byline was seen in um, newspapers in the United States and around the world. So you have now, I, one of the rare instances of a woman combat reporter mm. on the field with the soldiers. And I interviewed a lot of women who said, because Kate Webb's byline was all over the place, the newspaper started to look at women differently. They couldn't say women can't do that anymore because she not only was doing it, she was doing it very well. And um, usually wire service reporters don't get bylines. She did. She did so well that... Um, Eventually, she was named deputy bureau chief in Phnom Penh during at the very beginning of a very, very dangerous war. 
her boss was killed. And so she became the bureau chief. Now, I couldn't find any precedent for that mm. of a woman being bureau chief in exceeding in, in the war zone where she goes out and she is also the boss of the other people going out. And um, it was so dangerous that of course she got captured mm. and she was captured by the North Vietnamese in Cambodia for about a month. Uh, again, how many women have been captured? You know, I think maybe on one hand um, during that war to one, one, you know, three, I, mm. I can count off the top of my head too. Anyway. So, and, but none of them were like Kate who was so identified with the war. She, right. By, by 71, she'd been there since 66. So I think that's five years. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and and her and so um she was falsely reported dead. The New York Times wrote her obituary. Her family, you know, put had a memorial, but then she came back alive and um and wrote it wrote a series that was really good, again, with her eye describing the North Vietnamese, that um, you know, they're poor. She had horrible food, horrible health care, but so did the soldiers. She was not tortured. She was not raped. Mm. Um, but she went through horrible um, interrogation sessions. Mm. And she said, these guys are very dedicated. I mean, so you, 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 it was all, it was better than any kind of short story you could have asked or a situation report or whatever. Anyway, yeah. she then she put it into a book. Um, but by now, <clears throat> she's seen more war than most soldiers. Because remember, a tour of duty was not even a year, hardly. And so even multiple tours, you, they did rarely get to five years. So she's starting to have symptoms of what we now call PTSD. And so she was pulled out. I was going to say, uh, you know, that five years, in you know, when they call in country, I mean, what an experience. And it yeah. seems like, yeah, that is a, a, re a resource unlike any other, really. Mm -hmm. And um and she became, for the rest of her life, a functional alcoholic. And and she she's not longer with us. She died in two thousand seven, right? Yeah. Um, and um, but her 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 work was so amazing. And she and the one thing that she shares with Frankie and then the other woman we're going to talk about, yeah. is deep concern for the people of the countries that are being where the war is taking place. So Vietnamese and Cambodians, and that carried through the rest of her career. And now one of the prize, best prizes in Asia is called the Kate Webb Prize. And it's for the Asian journalist who um, does the best reporting that year in a difficult situation. Mm. And that just shows what Kate meant because she had so such a respect for the people, which was not always the case. I mean, these are yeah, white I, mean I, I consider that sort of still a, a, almost a radical position to take is to <laughs> just take the position and, and a point of view and not even like embrace the position, but just, you know, discuss the position of the other side. Yeah. Oh, I think that's very much it's compared to when we were there. It is night and day. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that you have um, bylines in, in all these newspapers from the people who've been hired there and they're covering their own countries. I love that. That was against the rules in the old days. Mm. And the, all the Cambodians or Vietnamese or Laotians who worked for um, foreign media, they never got bylines. They were barely, I mean, so I see a big, I think these women were ahead of the curve. Oh, absolutely. And, the way, What you're describing here is to me like the way war reporting goes in the decades yeah, right, after. Right. Yeah. And so then the third one, mm -hmm. It's the French woman, Catherine Leroy. Uh -huh. Now, um, people find her the most everything, the most unusual, the most impossible. How could she be that way? The most how, uh, how, how did, I mean, she is, she, there's no chart to get close to um, Catherine Leroy. <laughs> she was barely five feet. Mm -hmm. She had a hard time keeping 90 pounds on her little body. Mm -hmm. And, um, she was just a pistol. Um, her mother uh, said that she was born angry and feisty, and um, that was definitely her case all her life. She was raised in a, a right-wing Catholic bourgeois family in suburban Paris. Um, not at all um, a reader-writer kind of person. She um, she discovered uh you know, she discovered the piano and did brilliantly. She has that kind of left brain kind of um, uh, mm. aptitude mm. and um, was 
great in classics, but she wanted to play jazz. And she had a, a very important interview. And the guy said, you're, you're very good, but you're way too young. Come back later. And she closed the piano and never played again. Wow. That's an so, attitude. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so this is, she, this is just her. And so then she, um, for fun, she decides to, uh, on a dare from her boyfriend, she learns how to, um, parachute jump. Why not? Yeah. So she has, she has this, the black belt or whatever it is and parachute jumping. <laughs> and then um, she's, she's one of the people she meets is a, a former um, a French, a French uh, veteran of the first Indochina war, a Frenchman. And she gets interested in war and sees these amazing photographs in Perry match, you know, the great um, photo and, um, and, you know, reasonable magazine. And she says, okay, that's what I'm going to do. No experience, none, zero. Mm. So she gets a job in a boring um, uh, office in, in Paris. So she can earn just enough money to buy like a camera and a one-way ticket to Saigon. Wow. Zero. That sounds like a movie. And then, then she, um, but she's also smart enough to get a couple of letters from some photo agencies saying they wanted to look at her photos. So she comes there fully equipped with those letters and she gets her accreditation. And because she's got so much Mazi, um, she just walks into uh, the Associated Press office, which is the most important place for a photographer in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. It's the place. The great Horace Foss is the uh, manager. He was already a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer. Um, Germanic in his brilliant organization, creative beyond belief and open-minded. And so here's this little teeny little woman comes in and says she um, wants to be a photographer. And he said, well, I have this policy. I'll buy any good photograph, even from a woman. And that was radical. That was e radical. Even from a woman. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so he gives her a break in the sense that he says, okay, this is what they did in the old days. If they thought you were worth it, they give you rolls of film because that was expensive. You plop in your, your camera, you go off, take pictures, you'd bring back the roll of film and the ones that they, they bought the ones and then they kept their whole film. And so, you know, the Foss and the other members of the press corps didn't give Katrine, you know, more than a, you know, maybe she'll last a month, maybe two, who knows? Well, she's, she just throws herself into it. Mm -hmm. And she spends all of her time in the field, much more than anybody else. And she speaks no English, so she learns English from the Marines. So it's really foul. Mm -hmm. And she, that's funny. Mm -hmm. and, um, and because, just like the others, she did not know what she was supposed to do. So she makes it up. Yeah. And she's teeny. And that's to her advantage because of who she is. She refuses to let anybody help her because she knows instinctively that she has to be independent or they'll, they'll not take her seriously. So she own, she has her own backpack. She carries that. She, she hikes with them. She does not complain. She sleeps in the crump out in the open, just like the others. She eats their crummy food, she didn't care. And she just takes photographs and she develops this rule that uh, a photograph, a good photograph should, should be able to capture the eyes, which mm. you know, that makes sense, doesn't it? It captures yeah. blah, 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 blah. But in a war, what's the hardest thing to do is to get that close. Right. So, so she does things other people would never do. And, and she, she's little, so she can, she can slide around and take pictures from down under and from here and there. I mean, she's, she just invents all this stuff and, and she's hanging around so much that she has great photographs, for instance, of the soldiers, these cynical 18 year olds just being awed by their, uh, a visiting, um, a preacher who American pastor minister coming just to, to give them a sermon and just, the relief in their faces to have that she has them the disappointment when they don't get a letter in the mail bag out in the field. And she, you, you could learn, you could see their whole lives through her photographs. And, um, and pretty soon um, the, her, the, the press corps, particularly the, um, the photographers realized not only is she going to make it, but she's doing better than they are. Mm. And that's, that was not acceptable. So they did something I'd never heard of before. And I found this out through a Freedom of Information Act to request I had to get her American military file from National Archives. They, behind her back, 
um, connived with some press officers of the American military, McVie, and um, making up these inane problems she pro saw presented that she was too aggressive, too competitive, mm. too foul mouthed, too unclean. This is, she was just like the others. And that was the problem. She should have been ladylike. And, um, and they took away her press credentials. Wow. You know, that's like saying, get out of here. Your, your, your career's ruined. Well, she did not put up with that. Of course, mm. she got horse foss on her side and she got her credentials back, but, um, I re she really learned a lesson and she was prickly before she's really prickly now. And she watches who she works with, et cetera, et cetera. However, she goes on to become the first woman to win the George Polk prize in photography in history. Mm -hmm. The first woman to win the Robert Kappa gold medal award in history. And nobody knows her name in this country. Wow. And were those for particular photographs or for? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, um, and um, since my book, I've been really happy about how much um, she's got, how she, her attention. I mean, I think, I, you know, I don't pretend I'm, I'm inventing the wheel here, but it was really nice that to see the, her, her profile is going up and up and up. Yeah, I mean, just the in that sh segment I watched uh, of you on CNN uh, recently, the 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 photographs that were shared of, uh, that she took uh, were, I mean, I've seen a million photos of the Vietnam War, um, but they're they're they're, they, they're different in the way they they they, all, they tell stories. Um, yeah. They seem, I don't want to use the word cinematic because I don't feel like it, that's quite right, but there's a poetry to them and a humanity to them that, that does stand out. Uh, yeah. I find that really interesting. That idea that of like women because of their position uh of, of being outsiders and and kind of having to develop their own aesthetic and develop their own practice that was a major benefit and 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 contributed to how good their work was right it also for others it meant that they failed <laughs> right i mean i did not do the list of failures but um it 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 worked if you're these these three women were had all that were able to take advantage of it mm very much more than, I mean, they really took advantage of it. And, and they inspired other women. I mean, and I, I opened the book by explaining that um, Kate Webb, through a mutual friend, met me at the airport in Hong Kong on my way to cover the war in, in Cambodia. And in my backpack was Frances Fitzgerald's book. Well, I mean, I, th that's what I, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about your own experience, too, because you can shed light on this question of mine, which doesn't even have to do with women journalists. It has to do with journalists in general going to war, which seems so scary to me and horrifying. I mean, I don't ha I can I can honestly say I don't have that in me personally. When I st set out to study the Vietnam War, I said, I'll write a dissertation from a comfortable office in New York City. Uh, what I mean, I think you give, you've given me some idea of what these three women had in them. But what, from your perspective, why did you want to become a war correspondent? What drove you to see that you know all that nightmare going on and say, "I want to go over there and and investigate"? Well, first, the difference between you and me, <laughs> I'm a woman, <laughs> and my academic career was was blocked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a big one. And um, I'm a woman. I couldn't have gotten another uh, career in journalism. You could have. I hope so. Let's just, uh, let's, yeah. Let's just put that out there. Yeah. And no, then, I, I mean, your story, then, I've read your story about what happened with your master's thesis and, and your, your yeah, experience it, in academia was, uh, uh, I think, not an uncommon one for women. No, it wasn't. Um, it's not fun to be the first. But, um, but so, 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 but even given that, um, I know that it's my academic background that really much propelled me, but also because I knew women before. I mean, just one woman was enough for me mm -hmm. to know that I could do it. Mm -hmm. And um, and then secondly, you know, I came of age. My, I graduated from high school in 65. And within two years, um, several of my high school classmates were dead. Mm -hmm. um, I went, I, grad, I was a student of um, South Asian affairs, including Southeast Asia. That's you know, I studied it. So it was something that I cared a lot about. And um, it was not just, I knew it wasn't just bang, 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 but it was the most important story of, of, of my life and of, you know, globally it was huge. And then secondly, um, it's not that we, I don't think people compute that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> 
at least not, I mean, I was 25 and it's not like I had this great, you know, pluses and minus, nothing like that. But um, there was also the sense that, um, you know, you do something that matters. Yeah. And I think everybody shares that. And you have no idea what you're getting. No one had any idea what they were getting in themselves into. I mean, we didn't. The, I mean, if I'd known what I was getting myself into, what I've gone, I doubt it. Mm. How dangerous it was going to be, how hard it was going to be, how it would test so much of me. I don't think. However, did I regret it? No. Were there people in your life that were concerned and this and that like said, my parents <laughs> who would not go to the airport with me? Yeah. <laughs> sure. They said, because I was a member of something called the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars, and we we had studied the war, and we said, no, this there's no reason for us to be there. Um, and they said, so, you know, we're not supposed to be there, and why are you going? And mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, on and on and on. Um, so... Uh, Can you talk a little bit about that, uh, that, that, that organization? Because I haven't heard that. Um, and, and, and I'm interested in sort of like the academic end of it, because it seems like how, again, I, I keep on bringing up, maybe it's the wrong word, like anti-war movement, but it seems like there's, there's some intervention that's happening among academics about war policy. And it seems like that's, that's part of what's going on. Well, it's, it's like I was explaining to someone, um, even the word anti-war, um, doesn't do justice. I mean, if your country is following a policy that you study and you see all the flaws in it and you see that it is definitely um, destroying a country and destroying your society, it's not mean you're anti-war. It means, which is too small a word, it means that particularly the academic uh, community is saying, listen, this doesn't make sense. We have done a critique of it. It's it's a serious one. And it was mostly all, um, I think only one professor lost his job for it. Mm. Um, uh, and there were a lot of China scholars. There were not, there are very few Vietnam scholars. That's one of the reasons Francis Fitzgerald book was so successful. Um, we didn't, we weren't even studying it in, mm. back in those days. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't, I was a graduate student and most of them were um, professors, but um, there was this, there was a strong feeling that within the academic community, if you had to say something mm. that, mm. And you know, did they? Um, they're they're famous. They all they all went to become famous, and so on and so forth. And they have. Um, uh, I mean, I think when the recruiting drive came to my campus, University of Washington, the guy who came was Orville Shell, mm -hmm. California. He's now the head one of the honchos at um, at Asia Society in New York, but he was at Berkeley forever. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's these were caliber people that um, wanted to say. You know, we're, we're part of the academic community, too, and we do not agree with the professors who say this is a right war. Yeah, so, I was I was thinking because, so it was, yeah, it's, it's not these aren't fringes. This is this is part of the conversation. Right. These were not on the fringe. These weren't on the margin. These are important minds saying this is not. And, and never forget. And this is what people forget, I think, is that. When, when the United States refused to sign the peace accords, the Geneva Accords in 1954, so that they could then support the war with the South, they broke with their European allies. Mm -hmm. So they, weren't, they were isolated even in the international community. Britain said no, France said no, Canada said no. I mean, you, it's people forget how isolated the US was. And just the, it was not just, just the anti-war movement, which is huge. And I'm not saying that, and I'm not, I'm not in any way criticizing that. I'm just saying the the critique began in '55. Yeah, <laughs> right. In 55. It yeah. began with the French saying, "You guys don't know what you're doing. You're repeating our mistakes." Well, yeah, it, and you're, you're giving me such a vision of 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 you know anti-war being the, the such a small sort of word and one that definitely has certain I think popular cultural associations in the minds right, right. of Americans. They think of Forrest Gump or something like that when there's so many other sort of tentacles to understanding the these positions. Right, and um, the Pentagon Papers. Yeah, you know, right in the beginning, um, from the the American um, officials in the field, they said. This Cold War stuff that of Domino, we don't see any, we don't see any. Um, and that's what the scholars said. The Soviet yeah. Union wants to take over Eastern Europe. They don't, they don't 
care about Southeast Asia. And China had just won in 49, and then they, they'd had suffered all those losses in Korean War. They didn't have time, energy, or money for um, dominoes in, in, in Indochina. So it's like, what are you thinking? Mm. And it's, so the, 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 the critique was immediate. Yeah. And then as the war continues and it largens, then you get, you know, the, the biggest anti-war movement, I think, in history, right? Right. Um, so uh, I know we, we want to wrap up here, but I wanted to uh, ask you about Cambodia because you, you arrived there in 1973. Is that right? Right. right. January 73, right. What were the circumstances of you of you becoming part of this this group going to Cambodia? Because I I, I, oh, no, I, no, I no, you're confusing two things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I covered the war. Yes. And, and people. Okay. The Cambodia was part of the Vietnam War. Yeah. The Cambodia campaign. Right. So I covered it from seventy three towards the end of seventy four. Mm-hmm. Then I went back to the United States and I worked for the Post. And then because I couldn't. Because the Khmer Rouge won, and they turned this closed off the country and turned it into, um, you know, a big labor camp, um, where um, people were starving to death. They were being executed, and you know, you 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 fall in love with the country when you spend two years there covering yeah. it. Anyway, so I um, petitioned and petitioned to get a visa because I thought, um, with maybe a little bit of hubris, that um, if I went and I could cover it, then maybe I could tell the world what was going on. Ha, ha, ha. Hmm. Anyway, so at the end of 78 in December, um, they invited two journalists. They invited me and Richard Dudman from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, who was like um, 30 years older than I was, and uh, a veteran. And then they invited a, a British academic, Malcolm Caldwell. Mm-hmm. I went there for two weeks and very long two weeks because it was like um, I compared it in one article to being um, the uh, Danish Red Cross who were taken on a trip to the um, Nazi war, uh, you know, the extermination camp where you could, they only showed you what you wanted to see. And you had to you had to you had to work really hard to see what was behind the screen. And on our last night. So um, this this was the reason they invited us the first and it turned out the last journalist, Western journalists was because they had started, the Khmer Rouge had started a border war with Vietnam, mm-hmm. which just throws the whole domino theory into to the wastebasket because the only people who went to war after 75 were two communist countries. So he, they start the war and they're afraid they know that the Vietnamese are going to respond and they don't want, the Vietnamese to go all the way to Phnom Penh. They want to keep them over on the East Bank of Mekong. So we're like the goats tied to the um, fence posts to keep them away. Wow. And, and uh, but we don't know that, of course, because mm-hmm. nobody says, "Okay, you're you're going to be the sacrificials." So, but anyway, so we while we were there, we heard the back and forth across the border. They took us to the border, and on our last night, last day. We were found finally allowed to interview Pol Pot, mm. the first and the last to do that um, while he was in power. And um, all he t- told us was that he was, you know, he he knew the Vietnamese were in, going to invade, and he presumed that they would have the Warsaw Pact with them. That would be the Eastern European Soviet mm-hmm. alliance, right. and he expected the United States and Europe to send NATO troops. Mm. Wow. Almost two hours. And um, then we go back to the so official. T- you said two hours you were with Pol Pot? Yeah. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah. And then so we go back to our guest house and um, the men are upstairs. I'm downstairs. We have a good night dinner. Everybody goes to bed. And middle of the night, I hear um, what I thought at first was a garbage can because I was asleep and I wake up put on my jeans, go into the foyer, and there's a, a gunman who aims at me. I run into my room, close the door, hide in the bathtub, which is what you're always supposed to do in a war situation. And he doesn't follow me. He goes upstairs. I hear random gunshots. And again, about two hours later, here I am in Cambodia, no telephones, nada. And two hours later, um, 
I'm told one of the top officials from um, the foreign ministry come in and say they've murdered Malcolm Caldwell, oh, yeah. the, the professor. And he was the one who was openly in favor of the Khmer Rouge. Mm. So we go back and um, write the stories and stuff. And to my sh- shock, Dudman wrote articles saying that the Khmer Rouge are not genocidal, that he saw no evidence of it, that they're, yeah, it's tough, but he thinks the country's better off with them. And we saw the same thing. And I wrote, because of what I didn't see, because of all the fear I saw, because the lack of schools, all this sort of stuff, the opposite. So we had two opposites. And wow. people, people wanted to believe Dudman. Mm. Because it was, it, it, yeah. Anyway, so... Yeah. Um, so why did they kill Caldwell? Which is usually the next question. Mm-hmm. And you know, um, you don't know why they killed all the, you know, up to two million people. A fourth of the population died under the Khmer Rouge. So I don't, who's going to ever get a rational answer? But the best um, that I, I think the one that makes is probably closest to the truth is that um, they didn't want any more foreigners around. They somebody in the upper echelon did not like the idea that we were there, mm-hmm. and. And they killed Caldwell because he was not the journalist. They knew we would write about how, you know, blah, 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 blah. But it, it, it wow. turned out irre- irrelevant because within, within 24 hours, the Vietnamese invaded. We yeah. were already out of the country yeah. and threw them out. So, What an experience and something that I have to admit, I, I only learned about reading about you in preparation for this interview, which tells me, I mean, it's, it's un. You know, there's there's something that's 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 there's many things that are missing from our, our narrative of those wars. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wonder, you know, just to just to wrap up, I mean, you're someone who who, who experienced all that, all the trauma of war and, and 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 continued to write about it. And it's sort of kept kept going back to the war uh, in your writing. And as whereas, you know, you talk about other figures who fell into alcoholism and it's sort of like the Vietnam <laughs> War crush them, you know, and it was the signal event of their lives. And it seems like, I mean, it's, it, it, I, I, I assume it's kind of a signal event in, in your life as well, but um, you've continued writing about it. You've continued like, sort of bringing the story to you know, generations that pass. Yeah. But I also, um, I was a daily reporter. So mm-hmm. I um, was a foreign editor, senior foreign editor at NPR. So I was in charge of that, of news around the world. Mm-hmm. And then I went to the New York times and I did agriculture Yes, I did the Pentagon, but mm-hmm. I also did international economics and mm-hmm. I and I edited financial stuff. I mean, so yes, I keep going back and I've and I ended up um, being a, a, a expert witness at the Khmer Rouge genocidal trials, but mm-hmm. it's not my whole life. And yeah. I'm happily a mother and grandmother, so that helps. Yeah, I think you're well, I mean, everyone takes it differently. Um, and it seems like you know, you did, you did a book on travel as well, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it um, was an investigation of the travel industry and um warning you that um <laughs> that if you don't pay attention, it's going to overrun your favorite place. But anyway, um Well, your your book on on these three journalists is fantastic and I I wanted to thank you for coming on and and telling these stories and and I will be I will be talking about this book for a long time because it's 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 part of I think an important reconsideration of a lot of the things that we missed um, about the Vietnam War and and, and things that were are going to be important to us to understand moving forward if we ever want to get over that war (laughs) um, if that's even possible but thank thank you Elizabeth Becker I really appreciate it thank you thank you very much for inviting me I enjoyed this very much All right, Nostalgia Trappers, I think that is it for us today. I want to thank my guest, Elizabeth Becker. Go check out her book. It's called You Don't Belong Here, How Three Women Rewrote the Story of War. I cannot tell you how many different rabbit holes this book has opened up for me, and I think it'll be the same for many Nostalgia Trap listeners as well. Uh, So I just wanted to thank Elizabeth Becker again for coming on the show and sharing these insane stories, uh, and I think really important stories, and I hope you enjoyed our conversation If you like what we do on Nostalgia Trap, we really appreciate your support. We are an entirely listener-supported operation over here. Uh, So if you can, go over to patreon.com slash Nostalgia Trap. We've got lots of bonus goodies for those that subscribe to the show, including access to the entire series of Nom TV, which is my own 
video and audio lecture series on the Vietnam War. So really appreciate you checking that out. Thanks so much. And we will talk to you again very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.